Good morning and welcome and congratulations. Congratulations for what? Well, we did it. We made it to December of 2022. You made it to the 338th day of the year. Today will be the 49th sermon you could have listened to here. And we have made it into the holiday season. It is now upon us. I mean, Thanksgiving is past. Christmas is ahead. And as Andy Williams always sings, it's the most wonderful time of the year. But I have to ask, is it? I mean, think about it. I mean, we all know Christmas is supposed to be exciting, right? But the reality is that, that for many, this season has become miserable. There was a recent study completed in 2019, and they found these responses. 88% of the respondents believe the holidays are the most stressful time of the year. 67 stress about having to have the perfect holiday. 59 say the holidays are chaotic. 56 are stressed about the financial burden. 48 are stressed about finding gifts for everybody. 47% say they take on too much. And 35% cite stressful family events. I don't know if anyone can relate to these statistics. And in fact, the survey found out 49% of the people surveyed said that they find it difficult to enjoy the holidays and 33% flat out don't enjoy the holidays anymore at all. That means that 82% of the people surveyed are either having trouble enjoying the holiday or they just don't enjoy it at all. And I have to ask, why do you think that is? I mean, I think that even though we say Jesus is the reason for the season, the truth is the way we behave, the stress that we feel, that maybe it shows that there's something else going on in the holiday season. I mean, Christmas has become a commercial holiday. Stores are seeking to make a profit for the year on the last month of the year. Advertisers are pushing parents to buy their kids all the latest and greatest stuff for spouses to find the perfect gift for your husband or your wife. We're supposed to buy gifts for every member of the family, for friends, neighbors, kid at school, the co-worker, the secret Santa gift, the secret sis gift, the white elephant gift, dog, cat, goldfish, you name it, there's a gift for it. That's the holiday season. There are family Christmas gatherings, there are work parties, there's church events, school plays, concerts, vacation trips to see family, shopping trips to stores that are so crowded, instead of no room in the inn, there's no room in the parking lot. In fact, it was projected that in 2021, last year, the holiday spending in America was between $843.4 billion and $859 billion. That is more than double what was spent just in 2002. Yeah, let's be honest. I mean, we say that Jesus is the reason for the season. But I think too often, Christmas really seems to be about, about me, we, and them. Christmas has become about us, about what we like, about what we want, what we need to do or what we're supposed to do. And the truth is that we no longer have time to even worship that God entered into his creation to save us from ourselves. Now, before you start thinking I'm like Mike and I'm a Grinch, please, please hear me. I love Christmas. I love the story of the birth of our Savior. I, I love the story of God's love for us. The story about the greatest gift that has ever been given. But come on, the story of Jesus has been pushed out of our lives by much different stories. We now tell a story about snowmen and reindeer, Hallmark movies and advertising, Santa Claus, decorations, family gatherings, events, food, presents, trees, and on and on and on. Take the place of Jesus in our Christmas story. 
And I want you to know, in fact, I love Christmas so much. I adore Christmas. I love this story. That for years now, I have been trying to convince Mike that we need to do a special series called Christmas in July where we celebrate Christmas in July of the year. We strip away all the cultural and commercial stress of Christmas, all the busyness of the season, and we can focus completely on telling the story of Jesus without all of the outward demands on our hearts and our minds so that we have time in that year to just worship Jesus. And Mike told me, you have to wait. So you know what I've been doing for years now? I've been doing exactly what my pastor has told me to do, even though I want to do something different. And I've been patient and I've been waiting. But today, today he let me get up here. So I can't do Christmas in July, but today I get to begin our journey. I get to begin our journey through the Christmas story as we start our Christmas sermon series called It's all about Jesus. Will you please turn with me to Matthew chapter 1? And I want to begin in verse 18. Oh, and I love the sound of the Bible's turning. You can get your devices out. It's real easy. You just find that chapter. And here's what you're going to read in verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a couple things I need to let you know before we get started. The first is this, that you need to know Matthew is an extremely Jewish book. What he's doing, what he's trying to do, explaining who Jesus is, is from a Jewish cultural context. And that's actually one of the reasons why this is the first of the Gospels. You see, this is the book that will help people transition as they're reading it from the Old Testament story into the New Testament story and transition from completely uh, Jewish thinking into a more New Testament Christian thinking. In the very first chapter, Matthew started the first 17 verses. We're not gonna go through that, but he gives the genealogical record of Jesus. He's doing this through his adopted father, Joseph. And the whole reason this was done was Matthew was establishing that Jesus has a legal right to the throne of David because he is a descendant of David. But then in verse 18, Matthew switches. And now he goes to establishing what's called the birth record of Jesus. And Matthew has done this because he is trying to show us what Jesus' birth tells us about who he is. Now, Matthew doesn't record the actual birth story of Jesus. Luke does that for us. Instead, Matthew is telling us a very Jewish story about fulfilled prophecy and godly truth. Mary and Joseph are betrothed. Now, we need to understand that in Jewish culture, that means that they had been promised to one another, that they had made a covenant between them and God to be married. And a betrothal goes so much deeper than an engagement, what we think of when people make these promises. You see, for all intents and purposes, for legal reasons, they are considered, this betrothed couple, they're married legally. And though they're not yet living with each other, they have promised to remain faithful to one another until that day when Joseph can go and get his bride. And if during this betrothal period, if this relationship needs to end because it is a legal binding marriage, they could only divorce for biblical purposes. So this is a big deal. When Mary comes back and winds up being pregnant before the actual wedding night, this is a huge deal. Do you get that? This is a problem. And this is where we get to meet Joseph. Verses 19 through 20. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her 
is of the Holy Spirit. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us a lot about who Joseph is. But here, here in this text, he's called a righteous man. Now, now this does not mean that Joseph is perfect. It doesn't mean that he is sinless. But what it means is that here, we have a godly man who is striving to live according to the standards of God. And even though he had every right to believe that Mary had betrayed him, even though he had every right to openly accuse her, instead he's filled with compassion and he plans to divorce her discreetly. He wants to minimize the overt public shame and the potential fatal consequences that would come if he publicly charges her with adultery. But it seems in wrestling with this, Joseph is not fully convinced what he should do. Because as he's still considering it, God sends a messenger in a dream. And the angel comes and he assures Joseph, you don't need to worry about taking Mary as your wife. Don't be afraid of doing this. He is told that this child has been conceived miraculously through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a child of God. And not only will she have a child, but in fact, this will be the child. Do we understand that? that? That this is the child that was promised. This is the child that was foretold. This is the Savior they have been waiting for. Let's keep reading what the angel says. Verse 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. Now please, in the Christmas story, let us never just skim over this verse. This is one sentence. It is full of promise and power and fulfilled prophecy. You see, right here in verse 21, we read the fulfillment of what's called the Proto-Evangelium. I, I know, I know, you're looking at me, I get it. Proto-Evangelium. There you go, George. That's another one of those big words that you keep using. But don't worry about it. We're going to break it down because you all know this story. Right? I mean, you remember Genesis chapter 3, right? Y- y- y'all, can, y'all can talk back. Listen, I'm okay with you nodding and talking and making noise. I know Mike's all scary when he's up here because he yells at us. No, um, you remember Genesis chapter 3? That's the fall, right? That's when the enemy, the serpent, Satan, he tempts Eve. Did God really say what God said he said? I mean, that's the same thing Satan's been saying ever since. Trying to get us to doubt the word of God. And because of that, Eve and Adam disobey God. And because of that, sin now entered the world. And God comes and he says, okay... Now, because of what you did, I'm going to have to declare consequences because of your sin. The paradise that God had given them, the place where everything they needed, everything that they could have possibly desired was right there for them. It was perfect. Because of sin, it's now broken. Because of their disobedience, because of the disobedience of Adam, the world now is infested with sin. And because of his sin, the world is now broken in such a way where the life that God planned for us, it was supposed to be easy. God was going to be there with us. God was going to provide for us. Now, mankind has to struggle. We have to strive. We have to claw in the dirt just to stay alive. This isn't the way it was supposed to be. And because of sin, because of what Adam did, now death faces all of us. That's the consequence of his disobedience. But Eve, too, was going to suffer, and with her, all women, because of her disobedience. In the family setting, in childbirth, in this thing that was supposed to bring joy, that was supposed to bring fulfillment, that was supposed to lead to happiness and fulfillment in her life, there was going to be great pain that comes with it in the physical act of giving birth, but also in the fact that the relationships we're supposed to have in the family are no longer the way they're supposed to be. That the woman who was supposed to receive 
all this care and this love and this nurturing from her husband, she's now striving against him. She's now fighting him, trying to be over him and meet, and meet her own needs outside of the plan that God had for her. That's part of the curse. It's not the way the world was supposed to be. And it looks pretty bleak, doesn't it? But in Genesis chapter 3, God also gave a promise. This is what he says to the enemy in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. He goes, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, singular. He, singular, shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Right there is the proto-evangelium. That is the beginning of the gospel message. And here in Genesis chapter 3, we find two great truths about Christianity. First, that we are under God's curse because of our sin, because of our disobedience. We have worked to earn the enmity of God. But second, out of his love, God promised a savior. He promised that he was going to send one who would save us from our own sin. He was going to send one, and it was his work to defeat the enemy. But in defeating and crushing the enemy, he is going to take a wound in himself on our behalf. That is the Proto-Evangelium. That you all know. And here, back in Matthew chapter 1, if we don't overlook it by reading too quick, we see that God has kept his promise, as he always does. This is the child who was promised, the child who saves us from our sins. He has been born, and his name is Jesus. Now, Jesus, it's simply a transliteration of a Hebrew name. In the Hebrew, the name is Yehoshua. Some people say Yeshua, but there's actually an H-O in there. In the English, you know what we'd say that name is? Y'all know. Joshua. And it simply means this, that Yahweh saves or Yahweh is salvation. Now again, Matthew's a Jewish book, Jewish context. We've got to understand Jewish culture. This is a common, common, everyday, average Jewish name. But it's one filled with promise and with power. And this is the Christmas story. This is the story of God staging a rescue mission. He is coming into his lost and his dying broken world to save his lost and dying people. How? By sending his precious son. By sending a son who was born in a humble circumstance. Who's given a humble common Jewish name. But remember, it is still a name filled with promise and with power. In fact, here's what scripture says about the name of this child, about the name of Jesus. Acts 4 verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among which men, by men must be saved. But we also read this in, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. That being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And for this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name. So that, that in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the Jesus we're talking about. This is the Jesus that we worship. This is the Jesus you must make sure that when you are talking to other people about Jesus, that we explain it's the Jesus of the Bible. 
Because brothers and sisters, I'm just going to share with you, there are many in the world today who proclaim the name of Jesus, but it is a Jesus far away from the one we see in the Bible. In America today, in the world today, we can no longer say, oh, they're a good Christian person because they go to church. We can no longer say, oh, they're a good Christian person because they say that they believe in Jesus. The question you've got to ask is, which Jesus? The Son of God, God himself in the flesh, the God of the Bible, or a God of your own making? Please understand where we sit in history today and how important it is that we have a biblical view of the person of Jesus Christ. But, but this messenger, God's messenger, continues. And he shows Joseph that there's going to be nothing common about this child. Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Now, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. What does the angel mean when he says, now all this took place? He's highlighting fulfilled prophecy. Think about it. In just a short time, we've already seen the fulfillment of the Proto-Evangelium, and now we see the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. This miraculous birth that no other Jesus can claim uh, to was God's way of authenticating the birth of his Messiah. This miraculous birth was his way of authenticating the birth of his son. That his son is going to be unique and special and not like any other people. We know that many can lay claim to the title Messiah and they have tried. There are people today, did you know there are people trying to say around the world that they're the Messiah? Tammy asked me if I, have you heard about this guy who's saying he's the Savior, he's the Messiah? I said, which one? The guy in Venezuela? The guy in Brazil? The guy in Africa? The guy in South Korea? The guy in India? The guy in Germany? The guy, and she goes, huh, I guess there's a lot of them. Yeah. But no other person can claim to the stake that they are the Savior because they have fulfilled prophecy. Only the name of Jesus does that. Now, he is to be called Emmanuel, and, and as far as we know, that Jesus was never called Emmanuel as a name or a nickname. But when we think that way, we misunderstand what Matthew is actually saying here, what God actually said through Isaiah. You see, back then, a name is not just what we call someone— but a name is to identify someone in a deeper way. Their identity, their character, their person. And this child, this child that's named Jesus, is literally Emmanuel. This Jesus is God with us. Do you hear it? No, seriously. Do you listen when you say that? This is God declaring what we call the incarnation. This Jesus is not just a good man. This Jesus is not just someone, a prophet that God sent to show us a better way to live. This is not simply God sending someone to save us. That this Jesus that we worship is God in our flesh. Wow. That God loved you so much that he came to save you. Here, here's how John summarizes the Christmas story. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, and I'm going to skip to verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, 
and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. And the Word is, His name is, you no, know, you're right, but I, it's not that Jesus is the wrong answer. Listen, we'll do Sunday school rules. Jesus is going to be the answer nine times out of ten. Here's what happened. The Word The expression of God himself is with God. He is God. And he became flesh. What's his name? Je this is what y'all did. Jesus. Some of you don't trust your own answers. Some of you think, oh, we're in church. We got to be all oh, like what? No. I want you to think. Listen, I'll be here all day. I don't care. I need you to think. This God created everything. This God is all-knowing. This God is all-powerful. This is the God who judges. This is the God who is the creator of heaven and earth. This is the God, when we stand outside of his presence, we will be in hell. And to save us stupid, imperfect people, he came in the flesh to save us. His name is? Are we excited? We say he's the reason for the season, but we can't build up enthusiasm. We can't build up excitement about Jesus. I've seen people with more excitement about a football game, a race, or a basketball game than I do about worshiping our Savior. And I'm talking to the church. Why would an unchurched, unsaved person possibly say, I want to come and join this, I want to be a part of this, if we go around saying, Jesus? I'm not trying to be harsh on you, I'm just trying to get you to think. Do we live like we believe what we just read? Do we act like we believe we're, we deserve hell? Do we act like we believe we were on the brink of hell, but God came and saved us? Because if we believe that, I'm telling you, we should be excited. And I'm telling you, because I believe this with everything about me, from the tips of my toes to the top of my head, my big square head, Scott tells me. I love the Christmas story. I love it. I love that the incarnation of God is the very heart of Christmas. And if we're not celebrating that, if we're not celebrating Christ in the flesh, come to save mankind, then we are missing the reason for the season. The holy, perfect, infinite God brought himself to his finite, imperfect, sinful people. And God did this. He did what none of us could ever hope to do. He bridged the gap between mankind and himself by hanging his son on the cross. This baby we're worshiping today came to die. And now, now because of the birth of Jesus Christ, God with us, we now have a way to a relationship with God. John chapter 1 verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. The birth of Jesus, God with us, reveals God to us. John 14, 9. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Do you see that the birth of Jesus, God with us, provides us with a way to salvation? 
Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. 1 John 2, 2. And he himself, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Or 1 Timothy 1.15, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Do you see that the birth of Jesus, God with us, gives us the promise of a God who knows exactly what we're going through? Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to, to help in time of need. Do you understand why the enemy is working so hard to get us to focus on anything and everything except Jesus during the Christmas season? Do you see why this story is so important? Because in Jesus, God with us, we see a God who is not distant. He is not inaccessible. He is not unapproachable. He is not unconcerned with what we're going through. You see, in the incarnation, Jesus, God with us, we see a God who loves us so much. He loves you so much that he left the glory of heaven, that he put on flesh so that he could experience our pain, that he understands our suffering, our limitations, our weaknesses, and our challenges. Now, please hear me. I understand some of you are hurting. I understand some of you have suffered beyond human endurance. I know you have. But please, for one second, never ever, ever, ever give in to the lie that God doesn't care. He came to die for you. He cares that much. Never for one second, second think that God is the author of my suffering. Why does God burden me? Why has God done this to me? And instead say, thank you, Jesus, for doing this with me. Thank you for knowing. Thank you for understanding. Thank you for experiencing exactly where I am. And I know that you are with me and that you are going to get me through this if I get healthy or not. That you will help me get through this if my relationships are fixed and restored or not. If the brokenness is healed here or if I have to wait to be in your presence, I know, Father God, you will do all you've promised to do. Help me to be as faithful as as Jesus was during his suffering. And we read there that Jesus was also tempted in the same way, in every way that we are tempted. But yet he did not sin. And because of that, he is the perfect, sinless Lamb of God. And because he is God in the flesh that lived the sinless life, he can now be the perfect offering that we all need. Now, he could go and die on the cross for our, for our sins to give us a restored relationship with God. That is what we're celebrating. That is the Jesus we worship. That is what Christmas is about. And Jesus showed us, through his perfect example, the kind of life that we are called to live, a life of holiness before God. Now, because we are not Emmanuel, we are not God in the flesh, we will not live up to it perfectly like he did. But let us never say we shouldn't try. Let us never 
forget that you have the Holy Spirit living in you to help you to live a way that you could never do without God. We know how to live. Now let's make the choice to try to live it. Brothers and sisters, this is the Christmas story. This is the story I love so much. This is the story of the unbelievable gift that God has given to each and every one of us. This is the reason that we came here today to celebrate, to worship a great God. You see, the story of Christmas is not about parties. It's not about decorations or food. It's it's not even about getting that gift that you really want. Christmas really is all about Jesus. And because it is all about Jesus, because you have heard this message today, it means we can't leave here untouched. We can't leave here unchanged. We can't leave here today untransformed. Because you see, knowing this God, understanding what it means that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, it changes everything. And it leads to transformation in each and every one of us if we allow it. We, the people of God, we, the children of God, should now carry such a deep appreciation and awe at who God is, at who Jesus is, about what God has done, about what Christmas is truly about, that we leave here today joyful, not stressed, victorious, not defeated, proclaiming the glory of God, not mourning. We need to not worry about those things you've still got to do this month. You need to leave here not worried about the shopping that's not yet done, the the families that you have to visit, the cookies you have left to bake, the presents you must wrap, and all the things that will be added to your plate. And instead, we should leave here today hopeful, thankful, and excited. And we should leave here today with an understanding that because we have been saved, We've also been called. Please don't miss that. Because we've been saved, we've also been called. We have been called to love God and others just like Jesus in a sacrificial way. We have been called to live a life of holiness, rightness before God, being a positive influence in our communities for Jesus. And that starts in your homes, with your families, with your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, and from there it should flow. Because we have been saved, we have been called to leave here today to give the gift of Jesus to as many people as we possibly can. That is the story of Christmas. Let's pray. Father God, I come before you and I thank you for this day. I thank you for this opportunity and we are in your presence to worship you, to thank you, to glorify your holy name. May we be transformed. May we be deeply affected by your word. May you move in us to move from this building into the life that you've called us to. May we be excited and celebrate Christmas as it truly should be done. We can enjoy all those other things, but Father God, if they get in our way even a little bit, my prayer is that you sweep them out of our presence. That you bring us to an understanding of why we're here, of who we're here for. And may each and every one of us individually and as your body, this congregation, do all that you have called us to for our good, but more importantly, that you receive all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.